Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Oh, that thing moving means I think we're on. Oh, is that what is that what's happening? Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. What is going on, all my lovelies? Oh, look at that. You're so nice. It's very, very charming of me. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and a Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some Dark Poutine. Om nom nom nom. Om nom nom. This is episode 67. Woo! Woo! How about them apples? Yeah. And sadly, this will be the last episode of Dark Poutine. That's right. Mm-hmm. Scott and I have decided to call it quits. It was a good run. Yeah. What do they say? It's best to end on a high note. Yep. We've done so well. Yeah. And I... guess what? What? Just kidding. <laughs> April Fool's. What? Yeah. No, I was really leaving. No. Well. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, so that was our April Fool's joke. Pretty shitty one, but uh, it was an April Fool's joke all the same. Many heart attacks out there. You must continue to bear the burden of listening to us blather week after week. Yeah, that's the real joke. (laughs) That's that's the real (laughs) joke. You've got to keep listening. Exactly. (laughs) Uh, Just a reminder for those of you planning on going to CrimeCon in New Orleans on June 7th to 9th, 2019. Hey, do you want 10% off? Yeah, you can get 10% off your tickets. If you choose code poutine19 at checkout when buying your tickets on the crimecon.com site. Yep, that's poutine and then the number's 19. 19, yes. Poutine 19. Also, we have a bit of a giveaway to announce this week. What? I know. They're giving something away. This is exciting. My new friend and radio host and true crime author, Alan R. Warren. He wrote the book about Wayne Bowden that I used for our research into episode 17, The Vampire Rapist. He's been kind enough to offer to give away 12 copies of his book, either Kindle or paperback, about the Moores murders. So the first 12 Dark Poutine listeners who can email him at Radio Cub, and that's R-A-D-I-O-C-U-B-B, that's two Bs, Radio Cub with two Bs, at gmail.com with the subject line Moore's Murders will get... What what do we get, Mike? A book. What? Yeah, exactly. So the contest will be active between April 1st and 7th, 2019. Obviously because, you know, we don't want people emailing him a 100 years from now (laughs) about, can I get a book? (laughs) My guess is they'll go pretty quickly, so jump on it. Yeah, this is such an awesome, awesome giveaway, in my opinion. And this also might be the first of many giveaways with Alan, who is a very generous fella. You can learn more about Alan R. Warren and his NBC syndicated radio show, House of Mystery, at his website, somethingweirdmedia.com. Yeah, I highly recommend checking it out. And I was also on his show last Friday, oh, maybe, March 29th. Maybe, maybe don't check it out now that Mike was on it. March 29th, 2019. Have a listen in the show archives link from Alan's site. Now on with the show. 
We've been planning more episodes on paranormal happenings, and this is our second in a row. Every now and again, we need a break from all the horror and death of murder that we talk about, so these are meant as palate cleansers. Call it a podcast host self-care, if you will. Yeah, which is I think is a brilliant idea, because I think a lot of other uh, true crime podcasters out there can relate to how much of a, a toll... Uh, all this research and digging into and storytelling can There's take high on burnout. Yeah, there is. Yeah. yeah. And Mike does all the research. I just sit here and go through it with him and it's it's heavy on me. So, uh, yeah, yeah it, it's important to be able to take these self-care. Uh, just a little cleansers. break. It's yeah. just a little break. Yeah. So worry not, true crime purists. I know a few of you contacted me. We'll be back to true crime next week. With another horrific crime with the requisite creep for you to shake your fists at. Yeah. We've got tons more Canadian crimes to tell. Just because we're doing some paranormal stuff doesn't mean that we're going away from crime. And, and it is dark history after all. Yeah, and, and we're totally fine if these episodes don't float your boat and you want to skip them and stuff. It's totally it's totally yeah. fine. You, you're doing yourself a disservice by not listening because they're awesome. Yeah. But we totally like it. It's, it's, uh, who are we kidding? You're contractually obligated to listen. That's to them correct. All. Contractually. A lot of the detail in this episode comes from official documents of the investigation about this case, which can be found on the Library and Archives Canada website under unusual collections, along with 9,500 federal government documents on UFOs. That's some light reading. In recent years, there have been upwards of 1,500 UFO reports in Canada yearly, and that number is growing. Oh, really? I eh? still... You, you would think with the advent of the uh, mobile phone yeah, that it yeah. would shrink, but no, it's actually been growing. Well, I wouldn't think it would shrink. I would think it would increase, but I would just... I, my, my gut was telling me that just the amount of sightings would have dropped because it's... Some people are faking it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the spring of 1967, near Falcon Lake, Manitoba, an RCMP constable on patrol in his cruiser was flagged down by an agitated man with a fantastic story to tell. The man went on to make claims leading to one of the most documented and heavily investigated cases of a UFO encounter in Canadian history. This is the story of the Falcon Lake incident. So I'm, I'm going to quickly say that although I'm... Very skeptical on paranormal stuff. I'm a total believer in UFOs. Okay. So this... I'm excited. I think that like 99% of what is out there is fake, but I, I definitely believe that there's... This is going to be a fun one for yes, you then, I'm Scott. I'm stoked. I think you are Capital going to... Stoke. ...going to enjoy this. According to file 67-700-2 from Winnipeg RCMP's Division D near Falcon Lake, Alberta, it was 3 p.m. in the afternoon on May 20th, 1967, when RCMP Constable Solotki was patrolling the highway toward the town of Falcon Beach and spotted a shirtless male frantically waving at him as he passed. Falcon Beach is a small resort area situated at the west end of Falcon Lake, 90 miles or so east of Winnipeg. It's not overly active until the summertime, so seeing a frantic shirtless man on the road was unusual, especially at that time of year. Constable Salatki pulled a U-turn and drove back toward the man who was wearing a brown jacket but no shirt, as we'd mentioned, light-colored pants, and a gray cap. He was also carrying a brown briefcase. As he got out of the car, the man told Salatki to stay away from him, not to come too close. The man said he'd just seen two spaceships and was afraid that the constable may acquire a skin disease or be affected by radiation that the ships had admitted. The man identified himself as Stefan or Stephen McCulloch of 314 Lindsay Street in Winnipeg. McCulloch was a 51-year-old industrial mechanic at a cement plant and an amateur geologist, or rockhound. He was in the area prospecting when the sightings occurred. At around 12 noon that day, about a mile west and two miles north of Falcon Beach, McCulloch said he saw two gray objects in the sky, glowing red and rotating at a high rate of speed. 
As far as Constable Salatki could gather from McCulloch, whose eyes were bloodshot and was giving some incoherent answers, one of the objects had landed and McCulloch had approached, but the craft closed up and took off before he had more than a cursory look inside. McCulloch said the ship had sped away and he was hit with some kind of exhaust or hot substance from the ship which burned his shirt and the back of his hat as he turned away. McCulloch showed Slotky the hat, which looked burned, but he had left his shirt back at the site. He didn't let the officer near to investigate any possible injuries because he was concerned for the officer's safety. There were no burns to the back of McCulloch's head. The officer also noticed that there was ash on McCulloch's chest that looked like it had been rubbed on. Salatki noted that McCulloch's eyes were bloodshot and thought his incoherence may be due to alcohol intake, but he could not smell any booze on the man. McCulloch drew a sketch of the craft which looked saucer-shaped, and we'll share a photo of McCulloch's sketches on our show notes on darkpoutine.com. Officer Salatki offered to take McCulloch into town for medical treatment, but he refused, saying he was good to make his own way back. The officer drove off, leaving Stefan McCulloch to carry on his way. McCulloch made it back to town about a half hour later and went by the RCMP detachment looking for Slotky still out on patrol. McCulloch refused to come into the detachment and left when he found Slotky was not there. Much more detail would come out over the summer as McCulloch gave more statements to RCMP and wrote his own manuscript about the event. That's pretty pretty damn interesting. There's a lot of wiggle room on all sides of, of that story, but and, it's and all of that came directly from the RCMP report mm-hmm. on it. So it what, may be skewed a bit. Towards, it may be skewed a bit there, toward yeah. being skeptical as yeah, well. Yeah, for sure. Yep, for sure. The recent book on the subject, when they appeared, Falcon Lake, 1967, was written by Stan McCulloch, Stephen Sun, and Winnipeg-based ufologist. Chris Rutkowski, it's also an excellent resource, as well as the official documents. Mm. Uh, That book contains Stephen's manuscript in its entirety, and it's a fascinating read. In the introduction to the manuscript, written the same year as the event, McCulloch gives a description of himself and his background. Oh, good. And so we'll just let him tell it in his own words. Yeah, let's do that. And he's Polish, so he has a bit of a Polish accent. Oh, okay, bring it on. Quote, my name is Stephen McCulloch. I was born 51 years ago in Poland. After the turbulent years of the Second World War that started in my homeland, and due to the events that followed, I was forced to leave my country and go abroad. In 1949, I came to Canada, and some years later, settled in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I live with my wife, two sons, and a daughter in a modest home. I have steady income from my job as a mechanic at the Inland Cement Company. Two of my children attend the University of Manitoba. We live a happy, satisfied life of average Canadians, fully enjoying all the blessings this country has to offer us. Up until the time and the events I am about to describe, I had no special interest in flying saucers and other strange phenomena one hears about time and again. I had read about them, but... They meant to me about as much as the Loch Ness Monster. Maybe they are real, maybe not, but I had never been seriously concerned about them. Not until May 20th, 1967, when I, perhaps as nobody else, or at least a very few, came in close contact with one of those strange objects, commonly called UFOs. I'm getting excited, I want to hear. McCulloch, in other words, was just an ordinary Joe. Yeah until the events of that afternoon near Falcon Lake. But after that, according to all accounts, he was changed forever, Hmm. physically and emotionally. Oh, interesting. Okay. Piecing together the story from RCMP documents and McCulloch's personal accounts makes for a compelling tale. Hmm. It was the May long weekend, Victoria Day. That's a holiday that's been observed in Canada since at least 1845 and celebrated on the last Monday preceding May 25th in honor of Queen Victoria's birthday. It's called May Long by some Canadians, uh, while others who enjoy their beer call it May 2-4, as Victoria's actual birthday is on the 24th, coinciding with the number of bottles or cans of beer in what we call a flat or a 2-4. 
Yeah, do, is it, do, do any other countries refer to a case of beer as a 2-4? I don't know. I don't. I kind of think that this may, might be a Canadian thing. I think it is very Canadian. And so everybody in Canada celebrates this as kind of the first week of summer and Canadians come out of their winter hibernation, <laughs> not really, and take to nature often for a family-sized piss-up while camping. Well, when you like living in places like Manitoba, uh, coming out of, of winter and spring, you literally have been hibernating. It's yeah. just too cold out, man. Yeah. Steve McCulloch celebrated a little differently. He was going prospecting. Oh. After the McCulloch family had dinner on May 19th, Stephen's son dropped him off at the Winnipeg bus depot around 7.15. McCulloch hopped on a Greyhound bus to the White Shell area he knew well from his previous prospecting outings. You know, that would probably be a fun thing to do. I can, yeah. I can, I mean... Akin to fishing in the sense of you're just going out for some alone time yep. at a slow pace, just yep. you and your thoughts and water. My friend Art yep. is a, a rock hound. My friend Art, who lives up north in BC, he lives close to uh, Fraser Lake yep. in a place called Indaco, and he is quite a rock hound. Over the years, he's collected some interesting specimens, like even some fossils and stuff like oh, that. Very cool. My brother's yeah. turned into quite the rock hound as well. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah. I don't know if I have the patience for it, but... Oh, I do not. <laughs> no. So, McCulloch arrived in Falcon Beach at around 9.30 that night and checked into room number 13 of a local motel with his prospecting gear and the lunch his wife had packed for him. And his lunch consisted of cheese, bread, some smoked sausage, two oranges, a single apple and a thermos full of coffee. Classic. Classic, nice wife lunch. Right? Yeah. So after a quick cup of coffee at the beverage room of the motel, McCulloch hit the sack. He wanted to be up early to make the most of the day. Wait a minute. Did McCulloch just drink a coffee before bed? Yeah. This man's loco. <laughs> Some people do that. Carol can do that. I can't do that. Uh, due to my sleeping pills, I certainly can now, but m most of my life I could not. <laughs> I, I could drink like a pound of sugar or eat a pound of sugar and take my sleeping pills still. <laughs> McCulloch was up and at him at 5.30 a.m. Boo. He was out the door with his lunch and the rest of his gear and that gear consisted of uh, his brown briefcase, a hammer, a map, a compass, paper pencil, welding goggles from his mechanic job to protect his eyes from flying rock chips, mm. heavy gloves, and a jacket. He quickly made his way into the brush across the Trans-Canada Highway from the hotel. He got himself situated with his map and compass and started trekking toward an area he'd been collecting minerals at before. He was well prepared, this man. The, I learned orienteering in Boy Scouts and I used to be able to read a map, but yeah. I could probably lead you off the side of a mountain with it. I'm not the best at that. Yeah, I, went, uh, I learned a little bit of, and when I was at camp as a child. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I can't like just north. Okay, I can. Yeah, north. I can go about north. Yeah. I can, you know. <laughs> at around nine o'clock, he arrived at the spot that he'd been hoping to. Inadvertently, he scared some geese in a nearby stream who quacked and squawked at him for a bit before they calmed down. Uh, again, jerks. Geese are jerks. Cobra chickens. <laughs> exactly. Uh, like, chill out, geese, man. The guy's just walking, He's just doing his thing. My God. Uh, once they found that he was not a threat, they quieted down, and he began inspecting rock formations he'd found interesting and lost himself in collecting samples of quartz from a vein that he'd found. But back on the geese, they're, the, they're really the threatening ones. I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying. I love like having a hobby that you can get lost in like that. I'm like oh. that with uh, with uh, photography sometimes. and uh, Yeah, it got me through some pretty dark times. And writing. Because it was like meditation. Just, yeah. Uh, yeah you, and you're not thinking about anything other than what's in front of you. So. Yep. Yeah. McCulloch's stomach told him it was time to eat at around 11 a.m. As he ate, he took the nature in around him, resting, but was excited to get back to his rocks. As one would. Back at Chipping Rocks, he looked at his watch around 12.15, noticing that the sky in the west was getting cloudy. Hmm. Just then, the nearby geese began making a lot of noise, even more than when McCulloch had arrived. Was it a bear? Oh. No. No? Here are McCulloch's words from the manuscript in the book When They Appeared, describing what he saw. Quote, Then they saw them. 
Two cigar-shaped objects with humps on them about halfway down from the sky. They appeared to be descending and glowing with an intense scarlet glare. As these objects came closer to the earth, they became more oval-shaped. They came down at the same speed, keeping a constant distance between them, appearing to be as one inseparable unit, yet each one completely separate from the other. Suddenly, the farthest of the two objects, farthest from my point of vision, stopped dead in the air, while its companion slipped down closer and closer to the ground and landed squarely on the flat top of a rock about 160 feet away from me. The object that had remained in the air hovered approximately 15 feet above me for about three minutes, then lifted skyward again. As it ascended, its color began to change from bright red to an orange shade and then a gray tone. Finally, when it was just about to disappear behind the gathering clouds, it again turned bright orange. The craft, if I may be allowed to call it a craft, had appeared and disappeared in such a short time that it was impossible to estimate the length of time it remained visible. My astonishment and fear of the unusual sight I had just witnessed dulled my senses and made me lose all realization of time. I cannot describe or estimate the speed of the ascent because I have seen nothing in the world that moves so swiftly, noiselessly, without a sound." End quote. Woo! That's fascinating. Have you ever seen anything like that yourself? Well, he said that it was uh, the w object that didn't descend all the way was hovering about 15 feet above. That is close. Yeah. Your average uh, room height is about 10 feet. Yeah. So, like, that is bloody close. And so, no, I haven't seen anything. I I've seen some interesting things in, in my childhood living out in the boonies. Yeah. But, uh, uh, no, no. Never anything 15 feet from my head. We were liberating strawberries from a strawberry field one time. Yeah. And. <laughs> they needed it. They, they needed, needed to they, be liberated. They needed They needed freedom. to be freed. So I looked up in the sky and I saw these two things just as the way he's describing it. But they were lights. They were sort of like pinpoint lights far away. And they looked like they were moving along in unison just like he had explained. Yeah. But interestingly. They stopped and one of them spun around, like did a circle around the other one and just took off Shit. in a direction. And then the other one took off in the exact opposite direction. Wow. Okay. So I don't know what I saw, Yeah. but I, like they were little pinpoint lights. Yeah. Yeah. It could have been like, maybe it was a firefly or something. I don't know up it, in the, up in the, the sky, but it looked like it was in the night sky, like in the stars kind of thing. Yeah. It's, it's actually quite similar to what me and my brother had seen when we were children. We, uh, in the same home that I had that out of body experience in, but, uh, it, we were lying down in bed. We had a, uh, moon light, a moon, yep. sun root, whatever you yep. want to call it, uh, above our bed so we could see out in, in, into the sky. And we were lying in bed and uh, just watching, looking up at the, at the stars. It was nighttime. Where was this? Uh, it was in Penitan Lake. Penitan Lake. Yeah, Penitan Lake. So mm. it was uh, uh, out in the Kamloops area. Sure. Very, it's very small, isolated place. But yeah, we just saw like- uh, So a, you can see a lot of stars at oh, night. Oh, absolutely. The, like and no light pollution. There's no light pollution at all. And so, yeah, we just see this. It just looked like a regular shooting star just going along. And then it just suddenly stopped and immediately and quickly just like darted up to another part of the sky and then darted down and then- darted it just like bounced around like incredibly quickly a few times and then just mm -hmm. boo, gone yeah that's similar to what i saw yeah yeah and i don't know like were you in Penantown lake when i happened? was not i was yeah. in nova scotia in hebville nova oh, scotia good old hebville and we were liberating strawberries shout out to hebville <laughs> anyway but yeah so i don't know what i saw i don't i don't it was unidentified by me. Yes. And, and again, right? we were very young. So it was young, a flying so it, object that was unidentified by me. Yeah. So a UFO. Yeah, you, but I, the, I don't yeah. think it was Little Green Men. I really don't. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, I would have to err on the side that what we saw wasn't also a UFO. It could have been a firefly in the sky, but it was, because uh, again, we're talking like maybe three 
Yeah. Three, four years old, you know, and so. Just a little kid. Yeah. So, back to Mr. McCulloch. Oh, yes, him. Yeah, yeah, the story <laughs> we were talking about. After the one craft sped off, McCulloch was mesmerized and drawn toward the thing that had landed about 160 feet away. I can imagine. And that's like across the street. Yeah. He wished he'd had a camera with him as the thing changed colors from red to gray, red to light gray, and then the color of hot stainless steel with a golden glow around it. He didn't have his iPhone 10 with him? No, oh. it was 1967. Hmm, okay, so no. As he began walking toward the thing, an opening appeared in the craft and a bright purple light shone out. And it was so hmm. bright that it hurt his eyes. Hmm. McCulloch could feel warm air emanating from the thing. That sounds lovely, actually. McCulloch estimated the thing was about 35 feet wide and 12 feet high. So it's not very... Very, not very large. No. He heard whirring sounds like a motor, and as he got closer still, what sounded like voices from within, seeming quite agitated, one was higher than the other. Somebody was getting chewed out. Could so be. A, an alien finger wag and go, yeah. come on, Smitty, I told you not to f be so reckless while Not flying. to land here. Damn you, Smitty. McCulloch was trying to figure out what the heck he was looking at and not being a believer in aliens, he thought perhaps it had been some sort of super secret American airship. Yeah. He was looking for identifying marks. There was nothing. Looking for like USAF or NASA, but none of that was present. As he approached slowly, he called out, Okay, Yankee boys having trouble, come on out, and we'll see what we can do about it. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So, well, he's Polish, right? Okay, so, Yankee boys. And that's a quote. That's not me just making that up. That's uh. a quote. <laughs> McCulloch got no response and made his way closer still, trying greetings in numerous different languages. He called out in Russian, German, Italian, French, Polish and Ukrainian. Still no answer. What oh, damn, this man's yeah, is quite the... Uh, yeah, I barely speak English. Linguistically talented. Yeah. The purple light from inside the craft made McCulloch feel dizzy. He flipped down the green lenses of the welding goggles that he'd been wearing as he approached closer and peered inside the open side of the ship, taking note that the walls seemed to be almost two feet thick. That's pretty thick for a wall. <laughs> Inside were multicolored lights flashing everywhere, and McCulloch couldn't really make sense of what he was seeing. As he was just feet away, there was movement, and the opening closed in front of him, leaving no seam or evidence that a door had been there. Well, imagine if his arm was, like, in that door, and it cried, right? Whoa, goodbye arm. In fact, McCulloch could see no evidence of any welds or rivets on the outer skin of the thing. It looked like perfectly polished stainless steel or chrome that had been all cut from one piece. Maybe it was just like a big blob of mercury gone wild, floating away. That's silly. It is? Yeah. He did note a pattern of holes in the side of the ship, nine inches high and six inches across, that he later surmised was an exhaust port. Hmm. He reached out a gloved hand and touched the craft, noting it was extremely hot. He only noticed later that he had actually melted the fingertips of his gloves. Oh, wow. Again, in McCulloch's own words, quote, These most recent events occurred in less time than it takes to describe them. All of a sudden, the craft tilted leftward. I turned and felt a scorching pain around my chest. My shirt and undershirt were afire. A sharp beam of heat had shot from the craft. I tore off my shirt and undershirt and threw them to the ground. My chest was severely burned. When I looked back at the ship, I felt a sudden rush of air around me. The craft was rising above the treetops. It began to change color and shape, following much the same pattern as its sister ship when it had returned to the sky. Hmm. Soon the craft had disappeared, gone without a trace. Wow, yeah, I, I, I'm always just so taken aback by these, uh, when you hear people recount their experiences, because they certainly sound genuine, genuine and yeah. convinced, but yet then the skeptic side is always trying to poke holes in it, and so it's trying to find that middle ground in there of having some skepticism, but being willing to be like, okay, well, this could be legit. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. I got. To, I, I didn't get the feeling that he was lying. I watched some video of him mm-hmm. talking about yeah. the events, and I just there was nothing that I could say. Aha! Yeah, you know, yeah. like oh, there you go, we caught you. But the human brain can also work against us quite often, and you think you're seeing something that you're not. But mm-hmm. that's where, you know, when you sh- showed me photos and stuff, there's actual physical evidence as well. Yeah. So that's where you kind of have to kind of put something aside and, eh, okay, that's a different component now. A smell of sulfur and what McCulloch described as an electrical ozone smell of an electric motor having been burned overwhelmed him. And he would know from his uh, job. He's... Yeah. The grass and moss where the thing had stood was scorched and smoking in a clean circle, but no fire started. Hmm. Okay. McCulloch's head ached and his stomach swirled. The man who'd never taken a sick day in his life felt worse than he'd ever felt before. He barfed on the ground a number of times before returning to his tools and taking himself as quickly as he could back towards civilization, where he later flagged down Constable Solotki. By this time, he'd believed he'd seen something spectacular that not many people had, but he also felt something was terribly wrong with him physically. Yeah, okay, that sucks. We'll come back after the break with the aftermath of Stephen McCulloch's close encounter and subsequent investigation by police and other government organizations. I'm looking forward to it. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat, available now. McCulloch made it back to his hotel. He was feeling terrible. The nearest doctor was in Kenora, Ontario, 75 kilometers east. Stephen laid down in his room to rest, having to get up intermittently to vomit and evacuate his bowels. Hmm, shit. Literally. He noticed a grid of raised pink spots, large and small, on his chest and body where he'd been hit by the blast of heat from the ship's exhaust. He was terrified he'd been fatally poisoned and knew he needed help right now. Hmm. After calling his family to arrange a pickup at the bus depot, McCulloch hopped the Greyhound back to Winnipeg, being careful to sit near the rear, avoiding the other passengers. Well, he's a considerate guy. There's no doubt about that. His oldest son, Mark, picked him up at the bus depot and drove him straight to Misericordia Hospital at around 10.15 that night. Hmm. Stephen was treated for first-degree burns on his torso and sent home with sedatives and light painkillers, but the next day felt no better and remained in bed. The family doctor came by, prescribed him seasickness medication for the nausea and 292s, Tylenol and codeine, for the extreme pain. So some pretty heavy stuff. Yeah. The press had caught wind of McCulloch's encounter, so a reporter and photographer came by the home that evening. Ah. Uh-huh. And we've seen some of the pictures. Yeah, so that's where those came from. Man. That was from the reporters. Yeah. Interesting. There's some pretty fascinating photos. Like it, the, the marks on him, very uniformed. I, it looks like if you were to lie down on uh, a very um, checkerboard uh, pattern of hot rocks, and it were to leave uh, were to leave marks on you. Yeah, it definitely looks well. It looks like something man-made. Yeah, it, it's or that was manufactured. Yes, very uniformed. Yeah, you'll be able to see the photos on the dark protein page in the show notes. And is he wearing pajamas? Because yes. those look comfy. Those are comfy pajamas. They look comfy. After only three days, Stephen had lost more than fifteen pounds. Oh wow! He was unable to eat as he couldn't hold anything down. Doctors were, of course, alarmed, sending him for blood tests, which didn't show anything conclusively wrong with the clearly ill man. Yeah. He had headaches and claimed he could taste a burning electrical motor, and his family could smell that smell around him as well. Oh, wow. Okay. There was no evidence of any known types of radiation having caused his burns. Hmm. This is quite fascinating. Because you can't, like, this isn't something you fake. No. Well, I don't know. We well, don't I, know. I, I, you can fake the marks, but you uh, uh, to be constantly throwing up and 
pooping. Yeah. Uh, and that's your family's witnessing that. <laughs> Corporal Davis and Constable Zacharias of the Winnipeg RCMP interviewed McCulloch on the third, fourth, and fifth days after the encounter. Okay. He gave them his burned undershirt. It stank like the weird electrical burning smell that he had been describing. Yeah. It showed the grid pattern of the exhaust vent that McCulloch had described in the burn marks on it. What I was trying to describe. <laughs> they took his hat as well, giving it to the Manitoba Cancer Agency to test for radioactive materials. Oh, interesting. McCulloch's account was more coherent now that he was home and under medical care. You can read the whole RCMP interview from that day in our show notes for this episode on darkproutine.com. Yeah, good stuff. Press attention grew on Stephen McCulloch, and some coverage was quite negative, calling him a hoaxer, of course. Yeah, yeah. There was also interest from numerous investigative agencies, including that of universities and scientists across the globe interested in studying the McCulloch in his case. Uh, it, it, early case of something going viral almost here. Yeah. Even Roy Craig of Project Blue Book fame made an appearance by way of the University of Colorado. Hmm. And for those of you who don't know, Project Blue Book was a United States government funded investigation into UFOs that began in 1952, five years after the Roswell incident. Correct. Uh, didn't they just make a show about it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's on uh, History Channel. The History Channel, yeah. Only nine years old at the time. Stan McCulloch, Stephen's youngest son, remembers his dad being quite ill and smelling odd like electricity. Mm -hmm. As the press coverage came, young Stan was relentlessly bullied by some of his classmates. Oh, shit. Poor Surprise, yeah, you know. Poor Stan. That's what happens. Your dad is, is famous for something or infamous for something. and In the 60s. Yeah. And so the big brute kids with the cigarettes rolled up in their sleeve, the nine-year-old kids who smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, and you're just told uh, as the one bullied us, suck it up, or I'll yeah, teach yeah. you how to fight them back. Yeah. And, like there wasn't a lot of sensitivity. Act like a man. Well, yeah, it wasn't a lot of sensitivity around that kind no. of stuff back then. So poor Stan. On May 25th, the RCMP, with the help of a Royal Canadian Air Force helicopter, went looking for the spot described by McCulloch. He was still too ill to travel, so he couldn't be there to help. Yeah. And they were not successful at finding the landing site. But a pretty remote area. It might be difficult to, exactly. to narrow down if you don't have the witness with you. Or the exact coordinates yes. of it. Yes, yeah, exactly. RCMP and RCAF searched the spot for the rest of May and into mid-June on foot and in the air, but they couldn't find it on their own. They were really taking this serious. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, quite fascinating. I wouldn't have expected that. After officially calling the case closed on June 18, 1967, RCMP were compelled to reopen the case on June 26, only days later. Oh, okay. A man named Gerald Hart had reached out to the McCulloughs by phone. He knew the area near Falcon Lake well, as he owned a cabin near there. He offered to take McCulloch back to look for the site themselves. Hmm, that was nice. Hart was not a fan of the government and claimed they might be trying to cover this whole thing up, so he didn't want to involve them. The McCulloch family was not a fan of Hart's, especially as he didn't want to have the police involved, who had already put so much effort into finding the site. Sounds like he might have been wearing a hat. Yeah. A tinfoil hat. McCulloch's decision to go with Hart without informing the cops would mark a turning point in the relationship between Stephen and the police especially after he and Hart actually found the site that weekend. Oh, okay. The RCMP was red-faced, and the news media picked the story up again. Okay. So more supporting and more corroborating uh, uh, evidence for McCulloch now. Some members of the RCMP were convinced that McCulloch had been drinking that weekend, and the whole story had been cooked up to lead people away from a valuable mineral find he'd made elsewhere. Well, but it seems to be doing exactly the opposite, so. Right. Try as they might to get him to admit otherwise, Stephen stuck to his story. Yeah, which again would be the opposite of trying to get people to not pay attention to that site. At the site, Hart and McCulloch had collected soil samples, debris, and pieces of his burned shirt. Not knowing proper procedure, they tossed all the samples together in the same bag. Uh. Investigators were upset that the pair had not left the items behind for proper collection. Yeah, no kidding. All, however, were sent to Ottawa for radiation testing, and the area was cordoned off for the public safety to preserve possible evidence and to allow for further investigation. Yeah, that makes sense. 
The samples tested positive for radiation, and some that McCulloch had kept in his home were also determined radioactive by an investigator's Geiger counter. So radioactivity is pretty hard to fake. Yep. So that's, yeah, a lot of, a lot of credibility to him there. When investigators finally got to the site, it was almost exactly as McCulloch had described it in his formal RCMP interviews. More soil samples were taken from the area, which later turned out to be uranium-235, and the authorities said it was naturally occurring in the area. Okay. All right. So uranium naturally occurs there. Over a year later, the symptoms McCulloch was displaying match closely to what someone suffering from radiation sickness encounters. Yeah, yeah. Nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, headache, fever, dizziness, disorientation, weakness, and fatigue. Pretty sure I have, uh, I'm suffering from radiation. Radiation poisoning? Yeah, pretty sure. Over the intervening 14 months as well, the burns on McCulloch's torso would flare up a number of times, leaving him in agony. Oh, crazy. So they would go away for a while and yeah, then come back. That's crazy. Not getting the help he needed at home in Canada, McCulloch went to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He didn't receive his full medical workup from there until a year later, even though he'd continually asked for his results. Hmm. Conspiracy theorists point to this as a possible cover-up. Okay. Once McCulloch got the results, the diagnosis was neurodermatitis. And according to Mayo Clinic's website, neurodermatitis is a skin condition that starts with an itchy patch of skin. Scratching makes it even itchier. This itch-scratch cycle causes the affected skin to become thick and leathery. Oh, okay. A secondary diagnosis of syncope was given to explain the fainting, weakness, and low blood pressure. Hmm. Syncope is a temporary loss of consciousness, usually related to insufficient blood flow to the brain. It's also called fainting or passing out. The medical report indicated that this was caused by McCulloch having a slight cardiac condition leading to low blood pressure that just happened to show up at exactly the right moment. Yeah, that's what I was just going to comment on. Like, oh, how interesting and coincidental it is that these two things just happened to start right at this moment. Yeah, in, yeah. very interesting. Very interesting. And he, he and that it took him a year to get this diagnosis. Yes, that's a long time. Mm. I mean, you know, there was no internet back then, but... Conspiracy theorists may have been correct. It, there's some... Yeah, they, I'm, I'm scratching my noggin. Sometimes. Uh, the reddening of McCulloch's skin, or erythema, that showed up intermittently on his torso, along with the itchy patches in the grid pattern, each the size of a quarter, went unexplained. No cause was identified. Oh. And they did not respond to any of the known medications of the day. Just like the uranium, those were naturally occurring. Naturally occurring. And we have photos of uh, the lesions on McCulloch's stomach again that we'll show in our show notes. A year after the event, McCulloch and a friend returned to the site to explore. Hmm. And he wasn't with Hart this time. He was with somebody who was more trustworthy, I guess. He what, He didn't have his heart with him? No, not not Gerald Hart. Oh, oh. The conspiracy dude. Uh, from the, okay, that makes more sense. The men were exploring with a Geiger counter and rock hammers to see if they could find more evidence. In a crack in the rocks, right where the ship had landed during McCulloch's encounter, the men found two pieces of metal that looked out of place. Hmm. From the book, When They Appeared, quote, And judging by their generally teardrop shape, it seemed the metal had once been molten. As they worked with the hammer and whatever small tools they had, they brought up two pieces of metal, each about four or five inches long, that had conform conformed to the zigzag gaps in the rock as though a large amount of molten material had been poured into the crack. Mm -hmm. Their Geiger counter confirmed that these pieces showed radiation. Was this the source of the earlier readings? Interesting. It was once again a matter for the authorities to determine. Stephen and Marty, the man he was with, joked it was alien refuse. <laughs> Perhaps the craft had landed to offload some waste, and what they had was basically... UFO droppings. <laughs> oh, sweet. So, UFO turds. Yeah. Well, so, the UFO needed to stop and take a dump. I, everybody has to, Mike. We all poop. <laughs> we all poop. Everybody poops, even UFOs. E that's exactly I right. think that's a new t-shirt. Exactly. <laughs> everybody poops, even UFOs. Yeah. 
Because, I mean, if they just keep it all in there, you're going to get backed up. It's going to impact your ability to fly. Yeah. It's just a lot of negative consequences. So poop. Poop away, UFOs. Poop away. Needless to say, interest in the case was stirred up again after they'd found these two pieces of silvery material. Poop. The silver content was actually quite high in the samples. Oh. And there was lots of speculation about how it had gotten there. Some of the folks thought McCulloch's earlier exploring partner and government-loathing conspiracy theorist Gerald Hart might have been responsible. But how could he have done anything with molten metal that far from civilization? And, and wouldn't he then have claimed, like, oh, look what I found? Yeah, Not maybe. hoping that somebody will come back at some point. Exactly. And, yeah. Like... Doesn't make sense. He could, he could not have expected that these two guys would find it a year later. No. It no. just, it doesn't add no. up. And it's not like they were just lying there completely obvious and, yeah. This story was so well known, it was covered by many different media outlets. The late, great Robert Stack even covered it on the classic TV show Unsolved Mysteries in 1992. <gasps> and again by Dennis Farina in the revival of the show. Yeah. If you were a curious person and around in the late 80s and 90s, you remember this theme. Oh. And we could only play a few seconds of it there, but... Uh, we don't want to get sued. Yeah, we don't want to get sued. Oh, but man, that show... I, I still... I found it on, on a website where you can... Find movies. And well, things. it's all on uh, on Amazon Prime. Oh, that's actually where I was. Yeah, I wasn't illegally acquiring it. Yeah, it was on Prime. I started rewatching it, and it's just the theme song, uh, Robert Stack's voice, everything about it. I still get the ch the chills from when I was a uh, young. Do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah. Be, it, just a young fellow watching it and scared shitless, and but. I loved hearing it when I was younger. Like it, it meant to me I was about to be either creeped out, yes, or, uh, yes, or I, I had something new that I was going to learn about some unexplained crime yes. or event or something like that. And you know what? Unsolved mysteries is one of the reasons I got into cr true crime. So you can thank the ghost of Robert Stack for dark poutine. Yeah, yeah, like it. it during its run, probably one of my favorite TV shows. Also, at that time, I was probably watching Alf and Mr. Belvedere and stuff. But uh, Unsolved Mysteries, just oh, love it. Throughout his life, Stephen McCulloch stuck to his guns, even through regression therapy and hypnosis. There were no deathbed confessions with Stephen McCulloch when he died at 83 on October 28, 1999, in Winnipeg. Hmm. His family states that up until the time he died, you could feel the scars from McCulloch's encounter just under the skin of his chest and abdomen. Oh, wow. That, friends, is the story of the Falcon Lake UFO incident. Like, if you're, if you're covering on Unsolved Mysteries, it's legit. <laughs> you're too legit to quit. Yeah, like, this is, this, this is a legit... Uh, mystery. Uh, mystery, exactly. Like Cindy James. We covered Cin the Cindy James story. She yep. was on Unsolved Mysteries. So. Yep, yeah. So, like, this is only, like, for serious stuff. It's not just some rinky-dinky, oh, guess what I saw. And this, like I say, is the most investigated by the Canadian government that I have ever seen, actually. Wow, wow, um, wow. There are document after document that we're going to share the link to. Yeah. But... It's amazing. Like, they go into a lot of detail and these RCMP reports from the 1960s that just... It's amazing how much detail is there. Mm -hmm. It's really, really amazing. Yeah, for sure. And there's even, like, a letter from the Department of National Defense Shit. in there about this case. So it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I highly recommend you guys go to darkpoutine.com after listening. And it's some... There... It's probably going to be the uh, the most involved post that I've, I've had yeah. to post there because there's a lot of information that I want people to see. But if you don't, if if you listen to the shows and episodes and you don't go there, I highly recommend it because Mike puts a lot of fascinating details that you can uh, not always. <laughs> Usually, to this time. This time I'm doing yeah, it. a lot of interesting stuff that you'll find on there. So go check it. There you go. Whew. Uh, yeah, right? Fun one. Yeah. Before we go, we want to give some shout-outs to our new Patreon patrons. Woo-woo! And this week's good eggs are Michelle Treble 
from Mummel, Australia. Oh, sweet. Mummel. Interesting yeah. name. Yeah. Natasha from Texas. Sweet. Hey, Natasha. Thank you. Teresa Wymuri from Gaithersburg, Maryland. Sweet. Thank you, Teresa. Janie Percival from Ottawa, Ontario. Janie! Cassie Wallace from Bowling Green, Kentucky. And isn't Bowling Green University where Kevin Bieksa played hockey? I don't know, but I've always loved Kevin Bieksa. Yeah, I think he did. Yeah, he was great. And then there's Christine Thayer. Yep. She is from, I think, South Africa. Yeah, she's a brick Thayer. What's a brick Thayer? It's kind of like a brick layer. Is it Mike Tyson trying to Thay brick? <laughs> no, that's silly, Mike. That's silly. Brick Thayer. Uh, it's very, no, no, a, a Thayer as opposed to layer. Yes. It's is very similar, but they they have to apply the bricks much more gently. And I think they thay. do them instead of horizontally, they it's do vertical. it vertically. Yes. And ah. it, 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 it's all in the technique of, it's a very slow process, but the craftsmanship involved in brick thaying. Man, it can't. It, there's nothing that, that matches it, unparalleled. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a great job she's got there. Great career, great Fantastic. job, great. Good on you, Christine. It's not a very sought after career. So, and enjoy yourself in South Africa. Yeah, Melody Magliaro from Sydney, Sydney Nova Scotia. Hey, Mel- Melody. And Lindsay Stair looks like she upped her pledge. Thanks, Lindsay. Oh, Lindsay, thank you. Victoria Fernandez from Brampton, Ontario. Thanks, Victoria. Amanda Blackburn from Grand Island, Nebraska. Nebraska, whoop! Lots of corn. <laughs> I, love, I love corn. God damn, Me I too. love corn. Deanna Jones from Columbia, Alabama. Hey, Deanna, thank you. Jennifer Ailey from Ottawa, Ontario. Yeah, Another but, Ottawa. Yeah, I got some Ontarians. Nicole Rude from Eden Prairie, Minnesota. And it, I don't think she's rude. I think she's nice. Oh, if she's uh, involved in this podcast listening, she's totes nice. Totes. Totes nice. Well, thanks, Nicole. Shelly Price from Mount Vernon, Washington. Oh, there's the hop, skip, and a jump away. Carla McGrath from Kingston, Ontario. Any relation to Mark McGrath? I doubt it. Probably better off that way. Harry Sims upped his pledge to PM status. Harry. What the? Harry. He also went through TSA wearing one of our Don't Give Serial Killers Roommate <laughs> shirts. But it's a bold so, move, Harry. So taking your chances there, Harry. He and his family are on the way to, I believe it's Hawaii. You're my spirit animal, Harry. That's pretty funny. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. If you want one of those shirts for yourself, you can uh, snag it on our Threadless store at darkpatine.threadless.com. Thanks for upping your pledge, Harry. We appreciate it. And hope you and your family have a good flight and a great time. Yeah, man. That should be a blast. I'm jealous. Uh, Wendy Charbonneau. Mm-hmm. Yep, Wendy Charbonneau. Yeah, she's... Clearly from Quebec? Uh, no. Oh. No, okay, no. Okay, where is she from? Uh, Quebec City. Okay, that is Quebec, Scott. Look, it's much more specific. Does she work at a patinery? I, no, she doesn't. Oh. She works at a cheese curdery. Oh, yep. so she helps the poutineries. She, she aids in the poutine. Yeah. Uh, as, all, as all Quebecois do. Exactly. She aids in the poutine construction yeah. by making... Because we know that's the only industry in Quebec. It, that That is. Well, no, no. There's also the people who put syrup on ice. Oh, right. Maple syrup. Yes. Yeah, so maple syrup on ice. There's those yeah. guys for the treats. But yeah, so uh, actually a world-renowned uh, cheese curdery. Well, fantastic. Well, cheese curderist is what you would call her. It would be a cheese factory. Yeah. Semantics. Semantics. Uh, Michael Oz or Osborne from Neosho, Missouri. Hey. And he's a Yumber Yarder. We've seen him a few times in there. do have. Thanks, Michael. As well as Lindsay Kuhn from Penn Valley, California. She's also a Yumber Yarder. That's right, Lindsay. And then there's Jamie J. Oh, the coolest DJ in town. Jamie J. Jamie J. What? What? <laughs> Yeah, Jamie J. So where does she DJ again? Oh, where does everybody DJ? Ibiza. In Ibiza? She, yeah, she's like the the leading DJ. In Ibiza. In Ibiza. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's, uh, oh, she played play, play the crowds of like 10,000. Oh, wow. 12 hour sets. It's unparalleled. Jamie J. 12 hour sets. Yep. 
are is are the light shows quite cool? Or? There's no, it's actually all in the dark. It's, it's part of her gimmick. Oh, that's it's her part thing. Of, yeah, it's part of her gimmick. But she actually does some wiki wiki scratches, which a lot of other DJs aren't doing now. Yeah, they, they don't do that wiki. anymore. No, which which is that's why that's how I know of her. Because I'm an old school guy. So, Jamie J. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Matt Quillen from Morrow, Ohio. Hey, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Richard Lewis from Materi, Louisiana. And uh, maybe it's Richard Lewis, the comedian? That instantly what popped into my head. I would hope so. I'm going well, I'm, I'm to go with yes. Even if you're not Richard Lewis, the comedian, thank you, Richard Lewis, thank the you. human. Yeah, thank you, Richard Lewis. And just pretend like you're the comedian. And also uh, Larissa Warpoya. Well done. Uh, from Edmonton, Alberta. Thanks, Larissa. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that neat? Yeah, it's another gang of uh, contributors. That's awesome. Thank we, you all. We appreciate your contributions. Oh, man, do we ever. So much. So much. You mean so much. Like, seriously. Like, hopefully we can get to a point where we can sustain ourselves uh, off the show, and it will be completely due to folks like you. We just, well, we just and wrapped. also our listeners who continue to listen and give us our better numbers to help listen to our ads and yeah. those kind of things. That makes us money, too. Yeah, it's it's a legit humbling that we are have people who care about us this much to, to just to listen, to listen and contribute. <laughs> it's it's behooving. Oh, here we go with yeah. that fucking word again. Yep. Yeah. I knew Thanks like so that. much to our patrons past and present for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show. If you want to help support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash dark poutine. Or for one-time support, you can send us some donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. We didn't get any uh, donut money this week, but that's okay. I'm trying to eat better anyway. Well, you, you know you could take the money and, like, buy a granola with it, you know. Bite your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I I apologize to you and her listeners. <laughs> If you don't do it already, it'd mean a lot to us if you subscribe to the show. You can easily find us on iTunes, Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. Check out our website, especially this week, for more on this show, uh, www.darkroutine.com, and there's plenty of show notes, etc. Please give us a follow or a like on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. More importantly, tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Come to the umber yard. Come to the barn yard. Yeah, the new barn yard. Eventually, there will be a yarn yard. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're growing. Our, our yards are expanding. We have lots of yards. Dark poutine brings the folks to the yard. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, we did it. We did it. That's another one in the bag there, Scott. In, in, in the bag full of eggs and apples. But good eggs. Good eggs. So don't forget to be apples. a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Goodbye. I said to my parents, don't trust her. I wouldn't listen. Every family has a secret. Joy Delaney, mother of four, has gone missing. From the author of Big Little Lies comes a chilling new mystery to W. You were an emotional chaos sinkhole, Amy, and I'm sick of it! Starring Annette Benning. Nobody can break your heart like your own children. And Sam Neill. She will come back. Here we go. Strap in. Apples never fall. 
all new Thursdays, only on W. Stream on Stack TV.